welcome to NAPOD, where we provide NA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us to be self-supporting by visiting NAPOD.xyz, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two in the virtual basket. If you're also an AA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, Sobercast. Sobercast features AA speakers and workshops in the same format as NAPOD. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for Sobercast, that's two words, on any podcast player app or go to Sobercast.com. Enjoy the podcast, and thanks for listening. Thanks for hugging somebody. Uh, when I first came into recovery, they said uh, humility is a vital part of this process, and they described it as, for me as not me thinking less of myself, but thinking of myself less. And um, whenever this many of us get together, there may be some people who are new to NA. They don't even know how to speak sloganese yet, you know what I mean? And uh, addicts, by and large, come from the never let them see you sweat school of life, so you could be sitting right next to somebody in searing white hot pain, and they might not understand too much of what's going on, but they could feel that loving hug you just gave them. Yeah. So thanks for hugging somebody. Um, I want to begin by thanking the Creator, Almighty God, for cherishing me, sustaining me, guiding me in my recovery, and showing me how to live. I always credit God for bringing me to Narcotics Anonymous. And I credit Narcotics Anonymous for giving me a much more richer, fuller appreciation of the God of my understanding. A few housekeeping things. I want to thank Terry right there and Rodney. And, and you know, a lot of times they talk about thankless service, right? But service doesn't have to be thankless. Let's right now thank anybody and everybody who had anything whatsoever to do with putting on this fine convention. Yes. And uh, I've heard a lot of different uh, people speak here at this convention. And, uh, you know, in... in uh, it works out why on page 119 it talks about how um, there are many ways of carrying the message. There are many different styles. And uh, it talks about how some of us can get very honest. Some of us are very good in service. Some of us have a sparkling sense of humor. And some of us have the capacity to speak in what they term no uncertain terms. Right? In other words, I curse. <laughs> I don't want anybody to leave here and if you get asked, how was that a Usman fella? Don't say words to the effect of, rarely have I heard such a beautiful <laughs> exposition of the vagaries of addiction. <laughs> With particular emphasis on the Narcotics Anonymous modality of recovery. <laughs> except for an apparent inability on behalf of the speaker to avoid the propensity to prolifically profanate his English. <laughs> there, 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 there will be times when I will be describing a very low-down stank disease in no uncertain terms, you know. And if you're confused about what no uncertain terms is, it's, it's the difference between if uh, you ask... Uh, How's Usman doing in the hospital? He said, well, you know, his, his condition has been vacillating between guarded and critical. Or, how's Usman doing in the hospital? He's fucked up. <laughs> right? Now, you understand that. Now, if you don't come and see me and I die, you can't be heard to complain because the person's going to tell you, I told you he's fucked up, man. Yeah, yeah. I want to say that uh, I'm using Mike I's guns here. I have his literature, him and his wife Anita's literature. I don't have mine, so 
I might not, I'm more conversant with mine. You know how you have your stuff all hooked up, marked up and everything, tabbed up? So if I get a little confused, we're going to do it Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. style. And I'm just going to say somewhere I read. All right? And we'll straighten it out later. Right? We'll straighten that all out later, right? Okay? But I'm not a literature apologist. Sometimes people say, Oh no, oh my God, not another basic text quoting literature toting joker. He's going to get up there and read stuff. Listen, if you didn't want me to refer to this, you never should have sold me this shit. There was a woman named Dot T, and she said, recovery is like sex. That's That's what she said. Recovery is just like sex. If you're not enjoying it, you ain't doing something right. (laughs) So I'm about to have me a good goddamn time up here in Grapevine, Texas. I came a long way. To get to Great Vibe, Texas, so I don't know how to do this other than to really honestly try to the best of my ability and enjoy myself. Another quote from her, she said, recovery is like waking up in a burning house. The house is on fire. It don't make no difference who started the fire. <laughs> Whether it was your drug addict daddy, your codependent mama, your child molesting sister, your job is to get out the house. <laughs> So I'm just going to talk about how I got out the house, right? I, uh, I was talking to Terry. I said, Terry, what, what, what is the theme of this convention? She said, keeping our spirit alive. Is that right? Keeping, that's what I said. What you drinking, Terry? <laughs> keeping the spirit, oh, she's a sweetie, you know that. Keeping the spirit alive, Right? And that's what I'm going to talk about, keeping the spirit alive. But, you know, when you come to recovery, a lot of things that we take for granted, a lot of our topics, they only make sense to us. In other words, the reason I have to stand here and talk about keeping the spirit alive is because evidently something happened to my spirit. Why would I have to talk about keeping my spirit alive if my spirit was still intact? Hmm? In the beginning... When I was born, for a while I lived in what you could call the Edenic state. Like I was in the Garden of Eden. Life was just wonderful. I still had God's breath on me. I'm talking about a time, and I can remember a time. I can actually remember a time when life was just wonderful. I still was in touch with my God-given birthright. I could find no reason not to be happy. Okay, you're with me? Okay? I was just happy-ass little boy. Straight up and down happy. Happy, 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 happy. Just happy. Remind you of an old Stevie Wonder record which says, Listen to children's laughter remind you how it used to be. With, with a child's heart, go forth and face the words of the day. I'm talking about before you was black happy, before you was white happy. You understand that kind of happiness? Before you knew gender, it didn't make a difference if you was a boy or girl. You didn't know straight, gay. You didn't know nothing. You didn't need special toys to play with like the kids today. Every little kid you see is... You didn't need none of that shit. You were just happy. You could just play, play. You did shit like you made. You made mud pies. You just, whatever was there, you worked with that. Just straight up happy. You know, didn't know gender. Let me see what you got. I'll show you what I got. You know, just happy, right? And I remember that. I remember. I remember being happy. Life was just wonderful. Remember when you just looked at life with wonder and, wow, life is this is great. You know, and it, and it stayed like that for about five years, at least five, at least till I went to school. No, for real. I remember, I remember going to school 
And, and, and I was sitting behind a little girl, her name was Mary Ann. Here's what you need to know about Mary Ann. She had the most glorious, beautiful, golden pigtails. I had never seen that texture of hair in my home. And so, <laughs> I had never seen that. I said, this, that's, that's, that's deep. I reached out and I touched one of her little golden pigtails, whereupon she turned around and she said, if you don't get your little nigger hands off of my pigtails, you better. And I said, all right. <laughs> no, I mean, no, Jay, stick with me. Stick with me now. I'm, I'm going somewhere with this because I went up to the teacher and I said, Miss Trimaglazzi, uh, uh, Mary Ann used a word that I missed and maybe I was out when you went over the word. Could you explain it to me? What does it mean? And she said, well, what was the word? I said, well, she, she called me a nigger and I don't. She said, oh, nigger, yeah, well, don't worry about that. It was my, matter of fact, you come from a long line of niggers. <laughs> what she said. Wait, wait, wait. So I said, okie dokie. And I went home, and my mother used to ask me, she said, how was school today? I said, wonderful, yes. She said, did you learn anything? I said, absolutely. What did you learn? I said, well, I learned that I'm a nigger. You're a nigger, too. In fact, we come from a long line of niggers. Now, now, I got a point. I got a point. I'm trying to get to this point because this is my earliest recollection. Because this when that's when I got turned out. Right. Now, stick with this. This is a serious point I'm trying to make. That's when I got turned around. That's when life stopped being wonderful. Because my mother said, "Oh, you know what? Maybe it's a good time to give you the facts of life." So, all right, mom. What are the facts of life? Well, you see, we're black. <laughs> Okay, dokey, black it is. Okay. Everybody looked all kind of different colors in my family. You know, we look like the UN or something. But she said, we are black. I said, okay, mom, black it is. She said, and as a matter of fact, this is a, a, a broken home. I didn't know home was broke, but if you say so, okay. She says, and uh, we live on the wrong side of the tracks. And while we're at it, we're poor. I said, Ma, this is too much information for my life. You know what I mean? I'm trying to be happy and shit. You know, you're, giving, you're putting all this stuff on me. I'm only five. I don't know what to do with all of this. You understand what I'm saying? I'm talking about the birth of the disease of addiction. That's what I'm talking about because I'm talking about what, what happens to someone to where they, on a deep, down to the cellular level, buy into the notion that they're not enough. Huh? I mean, why would I have to reach out for somebody to give me something to make me feel better if, in the first instance, I wasn't enough? Huh? I don't measure up. Now, all of a sudden, I need permission to be happy. I got to get permission from the outside in to be happy now. Before I even pick up a drug now, I'm sold on the notion that uh, I need spiritual answers to my, I mean, I need material answers to my spiritual journey. See, and here we talk about our spiritual condition is the basis for successful recovery, offering unlimited growth. And here we talk about by making our spiritual development our primary focus, all other areas of our life develop naturally as it was meant to all. I don't know that yet. All I know is that now I'm being told that I'm not enough. Right? It's not like I went to school and we had what you want to be day. What do you call that? Career day. You know? And they said, little Joe, what do you want to be? And little Joe said, well, I just, I really pray that I can grow up to be Joe Pincushion. Just, you know, <laughs> intravenously using drugs all my life. <laughs> and Wanda, what about you, Wanda? Well... I would very much like to grow up to be Wanda Hostro. <laughs> Wanda Hostro. And Barry, what about you, Barry? I just want to be Barry back and forth. Just back and forth to the top man all night long. It wasn't like that. Something had to happen. I don't care who you are in here. This is what I know. Something has to happen. Let's keep it on me. Something had to happen to me for me to buy in on a deep level to the notion that I wasn't enough. And once I did that, here's what happened. Straight up on the heels of that, I learned 
desire. I'm talking about un, indifferent, I'm t- talking about indiscriminate desire. See, because it doesn't matter, I'm an addict to the core. It doesn't matter what I desire, I'm in trouble. Because there's a fine line in me between desire and craving. My mother didn't believe in breastfeeding. She said, no, there'd be no titty for you. (laughs) Oh, hell no. No, sir. (laughs) You don't know how to let go. (laughs) Shit. Did you breastfeed us? Oh, hell no. I didn't know how to let go. So the point I'm trying to get to is, listen, at an early age, at an early age, I was a few flapjacks short of a full stack. At an early age, I was a few french fries short of a happy meal. Right? Because the disease had me gripped up as soon as I bought into not being enough. And then it colored everything else that I tried to appreciate with my senses. Right? I became a sucker for a rush. For as long as I can remember, I was a sucker for a rush. I wanted to feel good. Even, let me just say this, because I'm remembering it, and I wanted to make a point of this. Even to this very day, I sometimes confuse feeling better with getting better. I can't believe I'm getting better unless I feel better. And what I do on a daily basis is just real sophisticated now. But I look for various ways in which to feel better. Just... It's just that some of them now are socially acceptable ways of feeling better. But I'm still looking, I'm still running round and round the tree looking for the stump. Anyway, I digress. So even as a little boy, I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, my spirit was shaking. It talks about it on page three, on page three in, in the Just for the Day book. It says the biggest harm done, right? Sooner or later, sooner or later, we realize that our greatest need in recovery is for, no, here, this is what I want. The greatest damage done to us by our addiction was the damage done to our spirituality. Our primary motivation was dictated by our disease, to get to use and find ways and means to get more. Didn't even say drugs. Right? And then finally, and saved by our overwhelming need for drugs, our lives lacked purpose and connection. We were spiritually bankrupt. So as a little boy, I couldn't even, I couldn't, I didn't know how to function in the world. I didn't, I needed guidance. I needed monitoring. I, anything I tried to do, I got it screwed up. I tried to watch one of my first, first, uh, uh, ways of getting outside of myself was through fantasy. I remember that. You know? Well, actually, the first thing that I got hooked up on was certainty. Right? That's why I couldn't get no titty. <laughs> Because my mother was uncertain of when I'd let go. So, yeah, yeah. So even to this day, if I get a good feel, then I try to ride it till the wheels fall off. <laughs> right? And then after that, after certainty, I picked up fantasy. And I remember I used to try to watch cartoons because we didn't have a whole lot going on back in the day. Little black and white TVs and with cartoons. And I'd watch them and, 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 and I'd get them all messed up, you know. If I watched uh, 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 Goldilocks and the Three Bears, I saw a B and E in New Jersey. We, that's what we call a breaking and entering. <laughs> Goldilocks broke into the Bear family house. She fucked up the furniture, <laughs> right? And then she tried to hook her up something to eat, and she tried like the the, the hot porridge and the cold porridge. Finally, she hooked up like this little porridge speedball, went upstairs and nodded out. That's how she got busted. Snow White was a little skeezer on the host straw <laughs> with seven little tricks. Snoopy and Sneezy and Dopey, and she worked them all. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yogi Bear was a rip-off artist with his little coke and spirit of boo-boo. And he just went to the park and ripped off picnic baskets all day long. Wiley Coyote gave new meaning to the second step. Some of you knew I remember was going to need that to marinate a little bit. So you give me some step work. And, uh... My, my favorite cartoon character was Popeye. Oh. I don't know. Listen, I don't. Maybe it's because he had those big attic looking arms or shit. You know? <laughs> it looked like he couldn't get a good hit, you know, like. He kept getting, he kept missing. And... <laughs> yeah, yeah. With his little, with his little crimey Wimpy. You know, Wimpy was the original dope thing. <laughs> I'll gladly pay you Tuesday. Right. That's the original dope thing. Right. But anyway, I like Popeye because Popeye caught hell. He didn't have no superpower thing kind of working. You know, he was just regular little Popeye and and um and he and he caught hell most of the cartoon. They just got his ass beat. <laughs> They changed people who beat his ass. He beat Brutus, and then the next day Pluto. He just beat his ass, you know. But in good attic fashion, he would he would go into surrender mode, and he would let you know that he was gone because he would say, "That's all I can stand. I can't stand it no more. I can't, I can't stand it no more. I can't stand this. stand this with an S. I can't stand this no more." And then something deep would happen, real deep. Real deep would happen, you know. All of a sudden, he'd reach into his stash. <laughs> and he'd come out with this silver tin, which contained a green leafy vegetative substance. <laughs> and he would squeeze it. And it would spinach would go up in the air, and then he would smoke it in his... Oh, he hit that spinach. Yeah, yeah, he hit that spinach, boy. <laughs> Popeye smoked that spinach. And then, and then all of a sudden he would transform. All of a sudden he had self-acceptance on a deep level. He said, I am who I am. God damn it, I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. What? What? Turned into like this little Rudolph Vaselino character. He turned a little skinny ass olive oil and said, Well, blow me down. <laughs> but why do I mention these cartoons? Because early in life, man makes habits, but later on in life, the habits make the man. Right. right? So I'm watching Goldilocks and I say, Look, if you, you know, you can't find another way, break in. <laughs> Do what, do what you need to do. You need something, do like Yogi, steal it. You want love, do like, uh, you know, Snow White, get with Lottie Dottie and everybody. <laughs> and then if things get real bad, do the Popeye, get you something to medicate yourself with so you can get through the day. Right? So, when my spirit got Broken, like it says here on page three, I tried various means of trying to get it back. You know, I remember picking up comparison. I came from a large family, and I used to like to play up the street with, at the Miller household because there was only Billy, his wife, his, his sister Gloria, and their parents. And I can recall playing with Billy, and his mother would say, Oh, you little boys, you've been playing very hard. Would you like me to fix you some lunch? Little Usman, are you hungry? I said, hell yeah, Miss Miller. She said, what would you like? I said, get out of town. I remember running home. I said, Mom, Mom, you would not believe what they have up the street at the Miller household. And she said, what, huh? I said, choices. <laughs> she asked me if I wanted a cheeseburger, a tuna fish, a bologna and cheese. They got all kind of stuff up there. She said, boy, get out of here. Don't act like you don't have choices. You know you can have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich if you want. And if you don't want that, you can have a, a jelly with your peanut butter sandwich. 
But what you need to know, in my house, it wasn't like we had Skippy, Skippy, Jiffy, Peter Pan. We didn't have any brand name, nothing. We had a great big silver tub, oil tanker size, industrial strength size peanut butter. You understand what I'm saying? I'm talking, we had this, this non-discriminate peanut butter. It didn't make any difference whether your bread was white, whole, wheat, Italian, pumpernickel, or rye. Talking guaranteed to fuck your bread up like peanut butter. If you had to, if you had to come up with a brand name for this peanut butter, it would have been ludicrous. When I move, you move, just like that. Just a great big all tanker sized thing of peanut butter lasted about ten generations, you know. Had a had a like a big oil slick on top and you, you had to kind of jump start it to it. Some kind of spreadable consistency type peanut butter. Sure, you don't like that? Go over there and hack your ass off a chunk of that cheese. That little welfare cheese in a long gray box. And, and, and one end would be yellow and the other end would be this color orange and shit. <laughs> Tough ass cheese. You, you couldn't even make a grilled cheese sandwich with this cheese. You try to make a grilled cheese sandwich, you done burnt up the bread, the pot. The only thing left was that same cheese in the pot. Looking at you like what? <laughs> I don't mean no grilled cheeses up in here. <laughs> Things started to get better and we, we got, we got one day, uh, we got matching furniture. <laughs> so, all right. Everything matched. And as soon as the furniture man moved the furniture in, my mother promptly proceeded to zip lock up everything in this thick ass plastic. Nobody's natural ass ever touched that fabric for five generations. <laughs> Then we got carpeted in a plastic runner, ran right up the whole house shrank, right down the middle of the house. And that's when I first learned to stay on the path. But what was really happening, I was being taught to love things and use people. I was being taught, my, 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 my people would say, we love you to death, but you fuck that furniture up, I'm going to tear your ass up. I love you to death, but you better not fuck up this carpet in. Because stuff was hard to come by back then. Yeah, yeah. Right? Then into, while I'm trying to grow up and be a man, you know, because, see, you got to understand something. All this time I'm the undiagnosed addict. Yeah. It's a bitch being the undiagnosed addict. Normal people don't know nothing about this. In my family, I was a first of my kind. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you can identify with being the first of your kind in your family. All the rest of your family going off, doing normal stuff, living, enjoying life like other people do, and you stand out by yourself because you are a first of your kind. Right? I'll give you an example. My mother was a very spiritual, religious, churchy woman. She, God bless you, just, she just, every other word was God, you know, and, um, you could do anything. And she said, well, you know, so-and-so did this. Well, bless his heart. God ain't finished with him yet. And one day she said, listen, could you come here, baby? I, I, I just need to ask you a question. I said, yeah, what is it, Mom? She said, sit down. I just really want to, I really want to ask you something. I said, yeah, what is it? She said, baby, what the fuck is wrong with you? about when you don't know. Your family's baffled and confused, but you're an undiagnosed addict, so you don't have no answer for this. She said, no, for real, what exactly is your major malfunction? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't really, I really don't mean to be like this. I mean, no, I mean, but you said you was going to go pay the bills. What happened? I got in the car and the car drove itself. <laughs> And then what happened? I don't know. I was minding my business. The next thing I know is abracadabra drugs. I don't know where they came from. <laughs> and you'll be serious. 
I'll be serious, because I wasn't trying to mess my life up or anything like that. I was trying real hard to be a family man, a brother man, a spiritual man, a working man, a husband, a father. Meanwhile, this guy was created, I call him Attic Man. Well, first he was like Attic Boy, right? Because I was like a working addict, you know? Uh, I was a weekend warrior. You understand what I'm saying? I worked hard, and then on the weekend, little Attic Boy would come out, and we'd go out and play. And everything seemed to be coochie crunch and under control. Until he started growing up. Little Attic Boy started growing up. I, how do I know? Because one day he jumped out. I'll never forget it. was a Tuesday. <laughs> I said, wait a minute, man. It's Tuesday. You shouldn't be out yet. He said, fuck that. I said, how are you talking to me like that? He said, because there's going to be some changes made around me. I ain't Attic Boy no more. I'm Attic Man. And I'm coming out any time I get good and goddamn ready. That's change number one. I come out when I want to come out. Number two change is you check with me before you try to do anything. Number three change, we're not in the days of the week no more. We use seven days a week, 24-7, right? And another thing, lay up all them holidays and stuff. We ain't in the holidays. I don't give a damn what the holiday is. Christmas, New Year, Thanksgiving, we work all year round. Next, we don't need to be going to nobody's movies. Movies, we don't need movies and picnics and none of that stuff. That stuff costs money. And all money is my money. And my life became a living hell. This is why this is why I needed to find a way to keep my spirit alive, you know, because I was trying everything. I remember telling my wife, listen, hold the money. Lock the door. You're going to hear some screaming and hollering. But whatever you do, don't open the door. The next thing you know, I said, woman, if you don't open this door, you're going to need, they're going to need dental records to recognize you. Open this door and give me my money. My disease spoke to me in my own voice. I said, hey, man, what's the last time you used? I said, I don't know. They so ago. And they said, you couldn't stop. Well, this is quite apparent that you can't stop any time you need to stop. Let's go get some of that stuff, man. Right? I tried the... Uh, Social acceptability. Because I used to go to work. I could always get a good job. Highly educated. Went to work in a shirt and tie. Had a little attaché cakes. Drove a little boxy Cadillac Seville. I used to think that because I could drive up to the drive up teller, that meant something. Poor little teller. She said, well, hello there, Mr. <laughs> Professional Man. How are you today? <laughs> I'm doing just fine. She said, would that be the full extent of your withdrawal? I said, I do quite nicely. Matter of fact, you're new here, aren't you? You should get to know me. I'm here all the time. <laughs> I drive away. A little while later, I'd be back. She said, oh, we're back again, are we? Said, yes, 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 we're back, we're back. Ray Charles can see we're back. <laughs> Some of the scene contingency of the road is going to require my immediate attention. You better give me three, five, ten. Make that 20 times as much money. And hurry up. You see, I'm in a hurry. Now listen to the progression. With 20 times as much money, I'd be back in 120th of the time. The only difference is not my tires all crooked, my high beams are on. And for some reason, my jaw has a life of its own. You said we're back again, aren't we? Yes, yes, we're back, my back. We're back, let's see, we're back. She said, oh, is there anything else we can do for you? She said, lean over here. I'm going to take what you can do. Just do your motherfucking job. That's what you can do. <laughs> Asking me, I'm not having a nice day. Hell no, I ain't having a nice day. Don't you know you can't even find decent people to get high with anymore? You can be, you can put your sit down, go go to the bathroom, take a piss and come back and shit to still be there. And I can't do that anymore. Everybody got these long ass curly, picky finger now, scooping the shit up. You can't even take a piss no more. Hell no, I ain't having a good time. Who trains you anyway? Don't you see me taking all my motherfucking money out of here? Where's my supervisor? 
bullshit. This is bullshit. I want to pull out my blame thrower and blame her. Because the disease, it's, it's hard to take responsibility for what you don't even know you're suffering from. I don't know how to, all I know how to do is pull out my blame thrower and blast people. I tried the geographicals. I remember uh, going over to Paris, France, me and my wife, before she escaped. <laughs> and I went over there and they said, come on over here, we're going to see the Eiffel Tower and the Louvre and Mona Lisa. I said, yes, sir, let's go. But you know, the disease of addiction is a is a international terrorist mass murderer. <laughs> Flew it in all languages and shit. And got over there, and the French are very funny, you know, because they, they you know, and I don't know that one is wet, one is dry. I've never been to the Thirsty Club. I don't know nothing about this, you know. So, so, so they drink wine with everything. You could order a bowl of cereal. What kind of wine would you like to get? Red or white? So by noon, I'm drunk. <laughs> See? Because I only got high when I couldn't get fucked up. So, and my drug of choice by then was more. What you, what you do? I do what you do. What you doing? Whatever you doing, that's what I'm doing. Right? So, next thing I know, that man jumped out saying, Bonjour, monsieur. Comment ça va? Ça va bien? Who's the truth on petit burger? Heroin. Mademoiselle, tu es très jolie. Avez-vous un petit peu de cocaine? I'm way over on the other side of the world, high as the Georgia Pond. And I'm, I mentioned the Wiley Coyote second step piece for a reason, because I remember coming back from there, and, 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 and I was sitting watching my TVs with my wife before she escaped. And one TV with picture no sound, and one with sound and no picture. She said, we need a new TV. I said, what, you got picture, you got sound, what? Anyway, on the picture set, you, you, well, this music started, and it said, come down to Jamaica, where we love you. Come on down to Jamaica, where the water is blue. And up out the water came this woman with a wet T-shirt on that said, Jamaica. I said, whoa, we going to Jamaica. <laughs> yes, sir. We're going to lay back on the white sandy beach with the blue water and kick these habits. And we made it to Jamaica. And I'll never forget, I came out the cabana and my wife had these uh, pina coladas, you know, and, and, and I said, if you lost your mind in somebody else's, don't you remember uh, France? She said, but they're adorable. They look, look at them. They have little parasols with the little cherries. And forgetting that in Jamaica, they use 151 rum. It's the same thing they fly their jets with. <laughs> But you know, addicts don't need a lot of convincing. She said, aren't they adorable? I said, they do look rather adorable. <laughs> I knocked back one of those adorable looking pina coladas. The addict man jumped out and said, yes, man. <laughs> yes, man. I feel real angry now, boy. <laughs> Talk to you with true with me, huh? What you think? You keep me behind the dumb eight ball? <laughs> with your white sandy beach and your blue water? No, boy. You can't do it. You can't do it now. Move your mumu clata and get me a nice big fat Jamaican spliff right now. I was off and running again. Hitting the fast forward button here. In the end, I was greedier than a gas station mom. I'm talking about being tore up from the floor up. Right? And I'm, I'm talking about my spirit. Right? Because in the end, it didn't matter whether I got high or not. I wasn't happy with the drugs. I wasn't happy without the drugs. And I did not know where to find you people. I was in hell. Somebody told me to make a phone call, and I did it. They said, ask the man to come get you and whatnot, you know. 
even before that, I went over, I went over, uh, my cousin's house, you know, because I, I was at the end of a particularly long run, you know, and sometimes you can be running so hard you forgot you haven't eaten since Carter made liver pills. <laughs> I said, oh, my, my cousin lived here. Knocked on the door, I said, hey, it's me. You know, I thought I'd come by. I know it's dinner time. I thought I'd bless you with my presence. <laughs> and they looked at me like, whew. They said, we'll feed you, but you can't stay here. I said, well, I don't know why you're acting like that, but... <laughs> okay, I'll just get something to eat and just take a little nap. And I remember laying down, and 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 uh, I woke up before I opened my eyes, and I could hear voices standing all around me. One voice was my aunt, and some of the voices were strange. She had a she had a priest, a, a, a city council man, and I was mad. I don't know these people. And I could hear my aunt's voice. She was saying, that's him right there. <laughs> Boy, had a good education. I don't know what's wrong with him. I sure hope you can help him, because he got to get up out of here. <laughs> and I called. I made the call, and I begged the people to come get me. I said, you got to come get me right now, because, listen, I just, if you don't come get me right now, all bets are off in the and, and the man said, well, we may have a bed Tuesday. That's Tuesday is way too far away. I have no idea where I'll be Tuesday. I don't know where I'll be the next five minutes. If you don't come get me right now, and the man said, okay, we're going to come get you right now. I said, because the thing you need, I said, excuse me, what you say? He said, we're going to come get you right now. He said, we want us to come get you right now. We're going to come get you right now. <laughs> So, um, what you mean, like right now, right now? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to come get you right now. I said, well, you know, I mean, you know, get, let me get my loose ends together. Get my in order. I was the loose end. I didn't have no affairs to get in order. I remember my aunt, uncle took me up to the spot. And uh, they said, oh, yeah, we, we do great things with people like him. And uh, if he doesn't make it, uh, we have a wonderful relapse program. And I, I heard her say, oh, he don't need to hear about no relapse program. This shit got to work for him right now. This ain't no relapse family. We don't play that. She said, Usman, you fuck this up if you want to. And I got that real, real, real clear. The only thing I want to say about that facility was thank God for H&I. Give H&I a hand. Yeah, because I met some wonderful people, wonderful people, and they had something I had been looking for all my life. They talk about it in the flat, but the step working guy, they had this thing called credibility. Yes. God damn, boy, credibility is a monster. Yes, you know, when you're talking to somebody who has hurt like you have hurt, who have cried like you've cried, who have felt what you felt, yes. and you knew it, they wasn't preaching to you, yes. huh? They wasn't preaching, moralizing, being self-righteous. They was telling you out of their own experience, strength, and hope how it was for them and telling me good stuff like, listen, when you get out of here, run to an NA meeting. Don't stop to pass go. Don't stop to get collect $200. Don't stop to get your swerve on and wrinkle the sheets. Haul after an NA meeting and sit on the front row, the intensive care unit. <laughs> Wave your hand in the air like you just don't care and say, I'm an addict. My name is Usman and I need help. I need one of those jokers you call a sponsor. Somebody reading from a later page who can help me better deal with what I'm dealing with at my stage. I need a home group. Not a home boy, not a home girl. I need some place like Cheers where I can go and people can just look at my face and tell what I'm going through. Because I don't know how to get honest yet. You can ask me. My ass could be on fire. And you say, how you doing? I'm all right. That's ain't good. Everything's all right. And I needed people who knew me to, to look at me and say, no, you're not. What's really going on with you? And I did that. I came. I got me a home group. And, 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 and people started helping me. People started feeding my spirit. They started sharing some good stuff with me. I was saying crazy stuff like, you know, uh, I don't know how I feel about this recovery. They said, what? I don't know how I feel about this recovery. She said, nobody give a fuck about how you feel. <laughs> you still trying to feel good? 
You wasting valuable get hot time. You smart? I said, damn. They said, but isn't that the horse you rode up in here on? Trying to feel good 24-7? How'd that work out for you? I said, all right, I get it. I said, but you know, I really don't think. They said, think. Anybody ask you to think? We don't give you the privilege of thinking back in step 10. Right now, pick your thinking and your feeling and put them on. You can't even pass the addict belief test yet. I said, what's that? You don't know what the addict belief test is? I said, no. So, well, if you want to know what an addict believes, don't ask them how they feel. Because some days you the, you the dog, some days you the hydrant. <laughs> some days you the fly, some days you the windshield. <laughs> Feelings all over the place. You want to know, you, you, you want to know what an addict believes, don't ask them what they think. Got a distorted thinking process. Don't consistently make good decisions. And please don't listen to what they say. <laughs> Whatever you do. Right? You want to know, because the proof is in the way we live. You want to know what I believe, watch what I do. I didn't know that. I didn't know how to monitor myself in accordance with what I did. Right? And and I could, I've always been capable of buying my own commercials. You understand me? Thinking I'm going to do one thing, next thing I know I look up, I done jumped out the bushes, molesting my goddamn self. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so I needed help. I said, listen, I need help worse than old folks need comfortable shoes. They said, the steps are the solution. Steps are the solution. And you're in the right place because we have a, we have a first step that's a thing of beauty. It's drop dead gorgeous. It's one of the finest recovering tools the world has ever known. You know, first thing you need to do, Usman, is understand that you have the disease of addiction. That's not your sentence, that's your diagnosis. That's what's been going on with you all this time. Next thing you're going to do is get past guilt, shame, and remorse. Guilt, shame, and remorse will kick a bone out of your back. See, before you do anything, you need to get the proper foundation for this recovery thing. You need to understand that you have a disease and not a moral deficiency. I don't give a fuck what you did in your active addiction. That's what addicts do. It talks about it, it talks about it in our literature on page 57 in the basic text, 5th edition. No, page 78, I'm sorry. It says, it says, many of us had difficulty coming into the fellowship. Why? Because we did not understand that we have the disease of addiction. So we sometimes see our past behavior as part of ourselves and not part of our disease. Watch this same page, 78, in the Just for the Day book. It makes the same point, right? It says, uh, it says that, uh, 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 when we used our behavior was dictated by the needs of our addiction. Many of us, again, it's not a requirement still identifies our personalities closely with the behavior we practice while using, leading us to feel shame and despair. Today, we don't have to be the people we once were shaped by our addiction. Recovery has allowed us to change. So, Sally, don't come into the meeting and say, I'm Sally and I'm a hoe. No, you're not. I mean, yeah, you got a double set of words. You may have sold a little pussy. You understand what I'm saying? But that's not who you are. That's just the behavior that was associated with the disease of addiction. That's not who you are. John, don't say I'm John and I'm a thief. No, you're not. You may have stole some stuff and you pick up, you do it again. But that's not who you are. They say come in here and you're going you to understand that you are powerless over your addiction. Don't just be running around talking about I'm powerless, I'm powerless, I'm powerless. I was going to work, but the alarm didn't go off. I'm powerless. No, 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 no. no, no. You're not powerless. You're irresponsible. Call your job. Say, look, Jack, the, the, the clock was broke. I'm going to be late, but here I come. That's recovery. You know, don't run around in the name of the first step talking about, hey, I ain't used the day, so it was a successful day. No, you can't walk down the street, hit a baby in the head with a hammer and say, I ain't used today, it's a successful day. No, you out your mind. You was at jails, institutions, and death. You would get killed hitting a baby in the head with a hammer. At a minimum, wind up in jail or in a crazy house. Disease don't need drugs to 
jerk your life around? Huh? So you got to understand that. You have to understand. And then, and in terms of the first step, how about learning when your first step is flown out the window? It don't need to happen the first step if you don't know when it's gone. Because a lot of stuff we talk about in here, like recovery and sponsorship and da 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 da, these are fluid concepts. I'm never going to reach a point where I'm recovered up with an ED on the end, where I'm a power greater than myself and I no longer fit the literature. Point being, I could wake up recovering my ass off. The poster boy for recovery. Look up recovering addict in the dictionary, there I am. And by noon, I could lose my monkey mind. These are fluid in and out type concepts. And I need to understand that. You understand? So I need to know when my recovery goes. And, 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 and something has to happen before I lose my recovery. I have to lose my consequential thinking ability. That's the joker I was before I got diagnosed with disease of addiction. I'd make the best of plans. I'd use stuff, crazy shit like shit, willpower, gritty self-determination. I am not going to use today, God damn it. I swear to God I'm not going to use today. The next thing you know, I'd be sitting on the side of the bed, busted, dusted, totally disgusted. Can't believe I did it again. Why? Because I had no consequential thinking ability. Today, the first step gives me consequential thinking ability. You understand? Yeah. And then I need to work a second step. I need to work a second step so I can come to believe, and that's a process. A process is like breathing. No matter how much I breathe yesterday, I better take a few gulps of air today. <laughs> And if I want to be here tomorrow, it's suggested that I take a few fresh gulps of air tomorrow. That's what we call breathing. And the same thing holds true for recovery. Because there's a very special, a special process I'm trying to get with in the second step, right? I'm trying to develop something that's crucial to my recovery. I'm trying to develop the gift of discrimination. There's a lot of powers out here, and I'm trying to be able to discriminate what's good for me from what's bad for me. You understand what I'm saying? Because a lot of times I can't tell. Because I told you I confuse feeling good with feeling better with getting better. Right? So a lot of times, just because I feel better, it won't be till I stop feeling better and the euphoria wears off and say, that wasn't too bright. Damn, you did all that without drugs too, didn't you? Yeah. So I need the gift of discrimination. I need to keep coming back till I get to a point where I've done something like they describe it in the third step. They call it tremendous, revolutionary, momentous, monumental shift, right, to where now I really realize what my greatest source of strength and courage is. At some point in my recovery, I had to shift from material orientation to a spiritual one. And until I did that, I was going to be on a rocky road. You know, it's like, it's like, it's like, if I'm in recovery, still trying to move all the material pieces around on the material puzzle board of life and think that that's going to get me where I'm trying to go. And where I'm trying to go is I'm trying to get real close to God. Right? But I'll say more about that later. But unless I make this transformation from a materially based spiritual certainty to a spiritual certainty, I'll be like a joker looking for an FM station on an AM dial. Don't make no difference how much you run up and down the AM dial. You're not going to get that FM station. Don't make no difference what I do in my life. I can change lovers, jobs, cars, cities, all of that. But unless I'm working on the spiritual realm, unless I'm trying to spiritually get better, it's not going to work for me. You understand what I'm saying, right? And I need to take that into into my fourth step with me. I want to settle down on this fourth step for a minute. This was a this was a real important step to me because uh, I had a number of sponsors, and it wasn't until I got a particular sponsor that I really got to understand the fourth step. First of all, I did not know, and maybe this is news for some people in here. I did not know that you had two different competing philosophies in recovery. Well, what are they? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> One. It's Freudian, psychoanalytical, right? Lay down on the couch, uh, 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 write about it. You can't write too much. And get honest. Go deep. Reach down. Dredge up 
some old deep shit out your past. Now, mind you, now, ain't nobody in here therapist and got no training to bring you back from where you might go. <laughs> huh? Hey, you might reach out for some real, real juicy stuff and come up with it and say, put out, sponsor. They might say, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Oh, shit. That's an outside issue. You might need some special help for that one, Jack. But in a word, it's past oriented. It's always focused on the past. Right? You can never, you can write too little, but you can never write too much. Just write it, write it, write it. The other philosophy is the just for the day. Gestaltist, existentialist, it's all centered on today. Right? And, it, and, it, and it's like what we read about in, in, in the fourth step. It says, with, we must be done. We must be uh, done with the past, not cling to it. Right? Um, it says uh, in, the, in, the, in the fourth step, in the works how and why, right? It says, uh, uh, we don't have to be the lifelong victims of our past. It says, and why are we here, right? We concentrate on recovery and feelings, not what we've done in the past. And we have a whole chapter called Just for the Day. And even in our readings, we say, we don't care how much how little you had when you connect this work and what you want to do about your problem, how we can help. Now, right, I didn't know that. And so when I first approached the fourth step, I used to make the mistake. And it tells you, this is a mistake. If you're doing this, it tells you, it tells you, this is the only step that tells you what the purpose of it is and the purpose of it is not. And the first few four steps I worked, I worked in accordance with what the purpose was not, right? And it tells you in here which one of these is a mistake, right? It says uh, in step four in the basic text, it tells you, it says, listen, some of us make the mistake, flat out mistake of approaching this fourth step as if it were a confession of how horrible we are, what a bad person we have been, like in the past, right? In this new way of life, a bend of emotional sorrow can be dangerous. This is not the purpose of the fourth step. The purpose is right there in the first sentence. The purpose of a search and a fearless moral inventory is the source of the confusion and contradiction of our lives. So we can find out who we really are. Who we really are. Because the honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness revolve all through the steps. 1, 4, 7, and 10 is honesty. 2, 5, 8, and 11 are open-mindedness. 3, 6, 9, and 12 are willingness. In the fourth step, I'm trying to approach a new level of honesty. Right? I need to understand what's really going on. What were you confused about? What were you confused about? I don't want to much of the sponsor. I don't want to hear about all, that, all you, all the drugs you used. All I want to know is what made you worship coke and dope. I said worship. He said, yeah. If that sounds too powerful a word for you, worship just means to give your all to something. It's like when you wake up thinking about something, and you go to bed thinking about it. Matter of fact, if the term of wake up means anything to you, <laughs> you might be getting in touch, you know what I mean? Now, I don't care what you use and all of that crap. I don't want to hear about that, how you use and where you use. I said, oh, let's talk about relationships. First it was Brenda, then it was He said, hold it, hold it. I'm not voyeuristic. I ain't no peeping Tom. I don't want to hear about Lottie Dottie and everybody. All I want to know is how did you confuse all of those women with God? I said, damn. That's what I said. Whoa. How about the jobs I lost? You know, I had a good job. I don't want to hear about money, property, and prestige, social acceptability. How did you confuse money? How did you confuse property and prestige with God? And then I started to connect the dots and see the general outline of what he was trying to me, trying to get me to get in touch with, you know, that underneath, like we talked about in the fifth step, and then the sixth step, underneath all of the defects of character, they're all children of fear. And fear comes from separation from God. Mm-hmm. If you don't have God in your life, you will be a scared somebody. Especially if you try to do it clean. So I got in touch with that, man, and, and I got entirely ready. And entirely ready is, is deep to get entirely ready to switch over to this new spiritual way of life. Because now I got to operate in God's time. Right? Now I got to operate in God's manner. Right? Now I got to operate uh, uh, understanding that if something's going to change, it's going to be because God's going to do it, if at all. Because that's part of entirely. 
Just because you pray don't mean things are going to get better. You just may get better with things. Now you pray for somebody not to die and they die. Now you got to not put a question mark where God put a period. That's your challenge. Huh? You pray for something to be removed and God say no. And that's the one word addict can't stand. Look, two letter word. No. What you mean no, God? Let me pray harder. Let me pray harder because I can't believe you said no. And my sponsor said, what makes you think God's perfect will isn't being done right now? You still want to be the one to decide what is and what is not best for you. Can't handle a no. Right? Then I had to take a look at the fact in the seventh step, you know, just because I stumble doesn't make me a bad person. Just because I fall short doesn't make me a bad person. I got shortcomings. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. But you can have a shortcoming. If anybody's in here struggling with a particular issue and it seems like it's taking a while to make what you think is progress, just understand something. It's all right to stumble as long as you're stumbling forward. Right? Because you know why? Even if I fall short today, it's not the same as before. Because if there was a time in my life I didn't fall short. I was short. (laughs) You understand? You take something like honesty. I come from a long line of card-carrying world-class liars. (laughs) Took great pride in being a good liar. You couldn't even swing with us unless you too (laughs) excelled at lying. (laughs) You couldn't run with my crew. You couldn't come back and say, hey, guess what happened to me today? What? I, well, I, w- I had an epiphany and I went to the police station and I just got honest. <laughs> what? You, you didn't get honest about us too, did you? <laughs> you, you got honest. That's how far away from honesty I was. I'm talking about the way you practice all forms of dishonesty, all forms of lying. Little lies of commission, omission, little white lies, bold fake lies. Stand in the mirror, practice straight face lies. <laughs> Look me in the eye and tell me you ain't lying, Usman. I am not lying. <laughs> yeah. So, so, well, what happens if in recovery you fall short? Do you know that falling short in recovery is different because today you have something that you didn't have before, Usman. You got some new values, principles, ethics, morals, standards to fall short from. One of the things I'm looking for is an increase in awareness. I still fall short today, but I'm aware of it. I'm aware of it. And that's the blessing, you know. And, and, and I had to get in touch with creating harm and making amends for the harms I created. And when I make amends, I had to get in touch with making amends appropriate to the harm that was caused. For example, if I was a deadbeat dad, don't try to show up doing material drive-bys today. I try to buy love with some new sneakers and, and and Nintendo and PSPs and stuff like that. When what was missing was the society. Your society was missing from your child. Because love is time, attention, and discipline. Can you show up? Can you spend time with your child? Can you be disciplined with your child? And don't blame it on recovery. You know, I remember going out the house one day, my daughter's little eight-year-old daughter, she said, uh, Daddy, I really need help with my homework. I can't tell her, uh, 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 baby, you, you, you like that DVD player, don't you? you? You like that flat screen, right? Well, if you want them to remain here, leave daddy alone. Daddy's gotta put, daddy, dad, daddy's gotta put his recovery first. They don't wanna hear that. That's not recovery. You get to a point in recovery, and this might sound like blasphemy, but it's true. You'll get to a point in recovery where you feel like you're in recovery tug of war. Yeah. Yeah. You understand? On one, one, on one hand, you feel the voices saying, uh, you know what? I gotta put my recovery first, cause you don't understand where I come from. If I put my recovery first, I ain't gonna tell them where I'm gonna wind up and all that shit. Yeah. Then on the other side, you hear the voices saying, listen, I got a life today. You know, recovery is a bridge back to life. Today I got a life, so I don't need to, re- da, 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 da. And, and, and my sponsor helped me so much, he said, listen, what's going on here is the test for recovery has changed. The test is no longer 90 meetings in 90 days. If that was the test, we wouldn't even not say 90 meetings in 90 days. We'd just say, keep coming forever. <laughs> Make a meeting every day as long as you breathe. Sometimes two. No, no. 
No. The test has changed. Now the new test is whether or not through avoidance of my personal responsibilities, I'm actually creating my own problems. <laughs> See? I can't avoid my children. They need help with their homework. That's my personal responsibility. Matter of fact, that is my recovery. I could be headed to a meeting and my child say I need help with my homework. That's my recovery. I can't be going off to the meeting with the sink pile high with dishes, clothes off, stacked up in the corner, talking about I'm recovering my ass all share like Shakespeare. There ain't no recovery. I could be sitting in, this is going to sound like real blasphemy. Do you know I could be sitting in the meeting using? Yeah, because I need to be home dealing with them dishes and them clothes and doing homework and shit like that. Right. It ain't about just, oh, I got a new car. I'm going to pull up to the meeting and park right up front. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm recovering my ass. I see my new whip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody need a ride? How about you, Big Buck Betty? You need a ride? Huh? Fuck Big Buck Betty. Get Stinky Ass Steve over there ride. You know Stinky Steve need a ride. That's where the recovery is. I had to learn to do a tip step, do it. Check up from the neck up. Yeah. What am I doing today? How am I living today? Take my spiritual temperature today. Check to see if I'm spiritually fit today. Yeah. Am I getting closer to my God today? I don't care what kind of icing I put on the cake. I'm not getting closer to God because that's the goal. We talk about we gotta go. You, if you listen, if you don't know where you're going, any road to do. Right? And the goal in recovery is to get to that point in the 11th step where you can deal with that little four-letter word only. A little three-letter word all. All I want is more knowledge of God's will and the power to carry that out. Right? And then once I get in touch like that, I have a duty, I have a responsibility to carry a nice, crisp, clean, narcotics anonymous message to the movement. Not no thirsty club message. I know where this came from, but we're grown now. I can't get that off saying, well, you know, I've been coming around since dirt. And, uh, first there was the thirsty club. Fuck the thirsty club. I'm not supposed to be up here with a little sucker tash smorgasbord message. That's right. to carry a nice clip. We even have an identity statement. It says, I paraphrase, if you can't get, carry a narcotics anonymous message, shut up. <laughs> Not no, you know, you know, I'm Frank, right? You all know me, I'm Frank, and I've been around since, uh, Carter made liver pills. I came around right after running water, and, uh, <laughs> You know, I got two sponsors, one in A, in A sponsor, then my thirsty cup. Shut up, Frank. <laughs> don't be, don't be peeing in the newcomer's ear like that. Don't do that. Oh, I'm, I'm Sarah, and, uh, you know, uh, I don't make meetings anymore. Shut up, Sarah. <laughs> you know, damn good and well, meeting makers make it through the storm. <laughs> Now, we'll leave it up to you, Sarah, what is regular attendance, because that can vary. You, you know, there's only so many hours in a day. Yeah. You might be able to make three meetings, two meetings, one meeting a week. But if it's regular, you got a shot. But don't come in here talking that foolishness. I don't make meetings. Well, shut up, Dick. Yeah. I want to close with a couple of stories. I want to close with a couple of stories. I love stories. I'm going to tell three stories. Y'all ready? All right, here we go. All right. One of them is raunchy. So anybody going to, you know, got thin skin, leave. Okay. Okay, here's the first story. Here's the first story, right? The first story is about these two guys. They were over in, in deepest, darkest Africa on the Serengeti Plains, right? And it was a beautiful morning, and they came out of their tent, and um, off in the distance, they saw the almighty lion. And, and one turned to the other, and he said, and, and it was deep because when they saw the lion, the lion saw them. How they knew that was because he started slowly moving towards them faster and faster. Whereupon one of them sat down on a log and started taking off his boots and putting on his sneakers. 
And the other one looked, said, are you crazy? Do you really think that those sneakers are going to help you outrun the lion? And the other one said, no, 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 my friend, these are not to help me outrun the lion. They're to help me outrun you. The moral of that story is, as long as you keep your spirituality, as long as you keep your recovery in front of the disease, you'll be all right. Right? Okay. Here's the raunchy one, and then I'll follow it with another clean one. There was this uh, village that was surrounded by a thick forest. And in this village, there was nothing for the children to do. No playgrounds, no basketball courts, nothing. And in this forest were these big, great, big, giant, man-eating gorillas, right? So one day the kids said, we got to come up with something to do. What are we going to do? So they said, I know. Let's, well, let's start a new sport. What would that sport be? Let's start the sport of gorilla hunting. Huh. Sounded like a good idea. Sounded like a bright idea, right? Right? Now, mind you, nobody had ever... Going into the gorilla, going into the forest and mess with the gorillas and come out clean. Everybody that tried it wound up with jails, institutions, and death. Undaunted, the little boy said, are we going to do this? And they said, and you know that. <laughs> and they turned to one little boy and said, you want to be first? And he said, and you know that. Why not? And he went and he got his father's gun and he went off into the forest. And he got into the forest. All of a sudden he felt a tap on his shoulder and he jumped. He said, oh my God, who is that? And the boy said, it's me, gorilla. He said, I didn't even hear you coming up on me. He said, that's right. That's right. I'm cunning, baffling, and insidious. I'm progressive, incurable, and fatal. And you didn't hear me because I defy detection, diagnosis, and treatment. But before we get started here, I want to tell you one other thing, and that is that if you come into this forest, I always resurface. Having told you that, you now find yourself in what can best be described as a hopeless de gorilla dilemma. <laughs> so little boy said, a hopeless gorilla dilemma, what is that? He said, well, you have two choices. He said, what are my two choices? He said, choice number one is, I can maul you to death right now. He said, oh, Lord. He said, oh, Lord. <laughs> he said, well, what is choice number two? He said, well, choice number two is I can fuck you in the ass right now. <laughs> now, wait, that's the gorilla talking. That's not me, okay? That's it. <laughs> the gorilla. So the boy said, oh, God damn. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> gorilla tore his ass up. <laughs> he, he, as he got closer to the forest edge, his mind started playing tricks on him like our minds used to play tricks on us, you know. As he got closer to safety, he said, you know what? I realized what I did wrong. You know what I mean? Kind of like, you know, when you used to get kicked out the spot, and you said, I know what I did wrong. I should have copped all at once. I'd probably still be smoking right now. His mind told him I needed a bigger gun, that's all. That's all it is. I just needed a bigger gun. He got a bigger gun. He went back in. Oh, no. Felt a tap on his shoulder. The boy said, that's right. It's me, Gorilla. And I know you know the drill. And the boy said, oh, shit. Damn. This time, the Gorilla tore him a new asshole. He left out the forest. <laughs> Digging up. Y'all watching the level? <laughs> he couldn't even walk straight. Like, really cool, a new asshole. And he did like we do when you get kicked out the spot. You know, he said, you know what? Nah, I'm mad. It's kind of like when, you know, people say, uh, don't you have some place to go? Because you don't spend all your money and shit like that. And you can't believe you're going to kick me out. You're going to kick me out. All the money I spent up in here, you're going to kick me out. You want to know what time it is? Do I have some place to go? I don't believe this shit. <laughs> now I'm mad. I'm going to get some more money. I'm going to show them who they fucking with because they don't know me like that. You know what I'm That's how he's thinking when he said, and he went and he got this big pump laser red dot. <laughs> Kill a gorilla shotgun type thing. He said, I'm 
Gorilla Killer Gorilla Gun. <laughs> He went back into the forest, and he took one foot in the forest, and he felt a tap on his shoulder. He said, that's right. I told you I was progressive, and I know you know the drill, but before we get started, I just want to ask you one question. He said, what's that? He said, you ain't in it for the sport anymore, are you? Newcomer, old timer, anybody. If you've made it here to what we call attic heaven, that's what this is. This is attic heaven. This is where you already been to hell, right? We've already been to hell. This is this is good as it gets for us. This is attic heaven. If you make it, you're so blessed to experience God's grace and mercy, to experience attic heaven, and you still choose to go back out in the dead world. Just remember, you ain't in it for the sport anymore. All right? All right, just a last little quick story. One day, the fox and the lion went to the restaurant. Right? And the waiter came, and the fox ordered everything on the menu. Fox said, I'm hungry like, you just bring everything. I'm hungry like that. Mm, man, I'm hungry. And the waiter said, all right, we'll bring you everything on the menu. And what about your friend here, the lion? What's he going to have? Is he hungry? And the fox said, what? He said, is your friend the lion hungry? And the fox said, is he hungry? Don't you know that if the lion was hungry, my ass wouldn't even be here? <laughs> and the moral of that story is this. If you are in this room, right? You're winning. Because if the disease of addiction was winning, you wouldn't even be here. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Please help us improve our ranking so others can find us by putting a review on Stitcher, iTunes, or your favorite podcast index. Napot is ad-free thanks to the folks supporting the show with a dollar or more per month. If you enjoy listening, you can join them by going to notpot.xyz and looking for the donate link. Thank you for listening. Have a great day. <laughs>